Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Happy Monday. I um, posted some announcements about this Friday's grasp is going to be slightly interrupted. My office hour will end at about 9 in the morning uh, because i got to get prepared for the Halloween show that you all are invited to from noon to 1. You definitely want to come see that. It's a lot of fun. Um, Grass will probably shut down at noon for the show um, because all the tutors will want to come down and stuff like that. So anyway, we'll we'll see what happens. But just realize I'll be in and after 9 a.m. on Friday, I will be kind of in and out because I'll be setting up and doing safety um, talks and things as we get the show ready to go because there's potential for people to get burnt and people to get frozen and blood and we want to make sure that everybody stays safe. Um, I think that was the only announcement I had to make. This week's the lab you have the lab packet for already. Um, and we're going to be doing a center of mass lab. Some of you were asking me about center of mass like it was in chapter 9, but you didn't assign us any homework about it, Mr. Balo. That was on purpose. We'll do a whole lab on center of mass, um, and that's where we'll talk about I'll do a little mini lecture in there, and then we'll go on and do center of mass and do the lab. I, uh, I had MRI yesterday, and the medicine they gave me to keep me from wiggling around inside the MRI machine is still taking hold, so... I'm feeling a little bit dizzy. We'll see how long I can stay vertical for that. All right. What are we doing? There you are. You've learned four-fifths of the toolboxes in, in physics. Okay? I mean, it's like, it's kind of amazing, right? The fifth toolbox you'll learn for mechanics, uh, you'll get in physics 4C. Uh, which deals with how things, uh, motions of waves and, and, and repeating motions and things like that. Spoiler alert, it's a combination of all of these. <laughs> okay, it's kind of like, this, the reason simple harmonic motions, the toolbox that most physicists reach for first, is because it combines all these things together, right? Has energy in it, all this kind of stuff. But if you're not doing repetitive motion, Energy is the one you reach for first. But we, I mean, you've come this far. That's very amazing, right? To, to have been exposed to these toolboxes and things like that. So what are we going to do? We're going to do them all over again in two, two chapters. Yeah. So this is, this is pretty big. Chapter 10 is huge. Chapter 11 is, is not as huge, but still pretty huge. We're going to, in chapter 10, we're going to do kinematics and energy a little bit of Newton's laws, and then carrying over into 11 will be Newton's laws and momentum. Um, but we've got to, the way we're going to do it this time is we're going to do it all in circles. We've been kind of preparing you along the way with some of this circular stuff. We've done centripetal motion and things like that. But now we're going to do sort of the real deal um, where everything's moving in circles. And how would you use these toolboxes to do that? So let's get started and get a language down for how we're going to talk about things that rotate. So, and, and I think you could probably see where this is going, and some of you are going to panic slightly, but don't worry, it's okay. Polar coordinates aren't as bad as you remember. They're worse. No, no, they're, not, they're just not as bad. So if I've got a circular path here, and I've got, I don't know, let's just drop a, there's an object that's sitting right there, then I can figure out where it is if I know how far away it is from the center of its rotation, like if it's going around on a circle. If I know the distance from the center to where it is, otherwise usually known as the radius, but it's a distance in general, and I know the angle that this thing is sitting at, I have a unique way to talk about where it is. I mean, similar to doing something like, you know, x and y. Because, I mean, we can map onto the Cartesian coordinate system here, right? Um, how would we give, like, the x location of that blue dot in terms of r and theta? Yeah, this is where we would reach for trig, right? 
And we, we can do all that kind of stuff. But like uniquely talking about where that thing is only as a function of that radius, and then that angle is pretty advantageous. You think about like a wheel, okay? As the wheel goes around, right? What's the thing that's changing here? Is it r or is it theta? It's theta, right? We're not changing how far away we are from the center. That'd be a really cool wheel, wouldn't it? Constantly changing its radius. No, we're, we're changing angle, right? And so when it comes to rotation, so back when we did kinematics initially, we talked about distance and displacement. We talked about velocity. We talked about acceleration. In those linear terms, Uh, you know what, let's, let's, uh, no, let's put that, let's put that uh, off to the side, where it isn't as important. We had like a position, right, and then we knew that if we change that position in time, we called that a velocity, and what happens if you change a velocity in time, what do you get? It's an acceleration, so on and so forth, right, we, we kind of had those definitions and we thought about them and all that kind of stuff. In rotation, how do we talk about like where we are on a circle, right? Or on a wire or on a wheel or something like that, right? So like if I, let's see, I put a mark. Yeah, I've got a mark on here, okay? It's kind of hard to see, but uh, that side just looks better. So I've got a mark right here on this, on this wheel, right? And if I like move the wheel, okay? The theta is changing, okay? Theta is changing, and if I let it go all the way around once, what was the change in theta? 360 degrees? One way to talk about circles, okay? There's another way. Ah, radians, right? Okay, so how many radians is there going around in a circle? Two pi of them. Um, so we could say that, and so if we rotated 90 degrees, we'd say that's like pi over two. Right, pi, three pi over two. There's lots of different, two different systems there, degrees and radians, we, you know, which leads to lots of confusions inside of our calculator. But really, for rotation, position is all about this angle theta. So if we wanted to measure a change in this angle with respect to time, what would that thing be? What is d theta dt? Or delta theta dt? Yeah, it's like a velocity, isn't it? We're changing a position in time, right? Now this, this velocity is slower, okay, than say that one right there, isn't it? Okay. But both of those things represent a changing angle in a changing time. Back when this was in a straight line, we said our change in position with time was called a velocity. Um, we need a name. There is a name. Uh, it, maybe it comes as no surprise that it's called angular velocity. Yeah, angular speed. Only we, now we need a symbol. Okay for this. Uh, we can't use V. V's taken. And it appears, it appears like we are going Greek, isn't it? We've used Greek symbols with all this rotation stuff here. So we're going to use the Greek letter and I warn you, you need to be careful about this Greek letter because I'm triggered when people say this letter wrong. Okay? This is the Greek letter omega. Lowercase omega, okay? It is not the letter you're thinking of. What's that? That's a W, okay? This is an omega. How do you tell? One's pokey, right? W's are pokey, okay? Omegas are sort of curly script in shape, okay? If I hear you say W, I not, might, might not be able to help myself. There might be projectiles. 
back in the day, it was it was kind of fun because we had these little tiny um, we had these little tiny bits of chalk, right? Never hurt anybody if you threw them. Don't throw a whiteboard pen at anybody. It's not good. I had a teacher that threw those little bits of chalk one time, and um, one day he hit. He picked up a piece of chalk, student had said something, he picked up a piece of chalk and chucked it. And the student ducked, and um, the piece of chalk flew over the student, hit the desk of the student behind, like hit right on the edge, and the chalk exploded and atomized, just, just like, just turned into this cloud of dust. And the poor person sitting right there had like hair this big. It, it, was, it was the late 80s. Hair was big, and there was chalk dust in the hair. It was it was really really bad. So yeah, try not to throw anything anymore. All right. So that's a Greek letter omega. Uh, okay. So an omega, an angular speed. We'll get to the velocity component in a second with directions. Okay. So which so look at this omega, and then look at this omega. Which one was bigger? Second one, right? It's, 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 it's going around faster, right? Okay. And then if I slow it down, right, then I've got a slower omega, right? And if I stop it, what's its omega? Zero. Okay. So now we jump one more, right? If we're going to change our omega, change our angular speed, what happened? What did we call it when we changed our linear speed? Acceleration. Called it acceleration, right? So we need angular acceleration. We need a symbol that reminds us of acceleration, but is Greek. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. I should have warned you guys. You should have brought your togas today, because basically we're at a toga party, right? We're taking all of the exact same ideas that we had out of kinematics and we are writing them down with Greek symbols, okay? Carrying them over now to an idea, okay? What does angular acceleration look like? Okay, well, what have I got here? What is this? Constant angular velocity, right? So what's the alpha? What's the acceleration? Zero, nothing's changing here, right? And so in order for there to be an acceleration, I have to change the angular speed in time. That would have been a negative alpha. Why negative? It slowed it down, right? And if I want to speed it up, right, the entire time I'm applying, right, that increase, I would have had a positive alpha, right? So we're carrying over the same ideas. It's just that now we've got to be really careful. It's, it's about things that are going in circles, right, instead of moving in straight lines. But, but, like all things, there is a Google Translate for getting back and forth between linear and rotational ideas. Because if we talk about distance traveled by this object right here, like say the object starts here and gets to here, how would we talk about the distance it traveled? This would be arc length, because a distance is measured in what? Meters. Like a linear length of meters, right? An angle is measured in radians, isn't it? A radius is measured in meters, but like, you're not changing. So how do we find the distance this thing traveled? We've got to remember something called the arc length. That arc length is going to be the radius times the angle that it went through. And it has units of meters. An arc length is a distance in meters. What are the units of radius? It's a meter, right? It's, again, it's another distance. So what do the units of the angle have to be in order for something in meters to be multiplied by it so that the thing comes out in meters? 
It has to have no units, right? We can't add another unit in here and have it come out right. What's a radian? Okay, okay, all right. Somebody went there, all right. What's pi? It's yummy is what it is. Um, it, we are getting towards the end of October in the Balo family. So in the Balo family, we, ha we, start sell it, we have a tradition called the month of pi. This is not happens, it doesn't happen in March um, for Pi Day. This happens in November. We start making about one to two pies per day in the run up to Thanksgiving. There was a crisis in cosmology that took place in the Balo family um, several years ago. We were sitting around, we'd had Thanksgiving dinner, and we were full, but there was pie. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this, right? Where you, you, you just stuffed yourself, but then there was all these good pies. And so what do you do? You make yourself sick anyway, right? And so we reverted and said, okay, look, we're all adults now. We don't have any kids to, you know, be good, you know, examples to. Let's have pie for lunch, right? We'll have, we'll have pie for lunch, and then we'll have our Thanksgiving dinner later, right? And that worked out beautifully, okay? But then we had a problem. There were like 10 to 12 pies to choose from for lunch. And you can only like do sli pie slices so big before they just are meaningless anymore, right? So we're like, oh, wait a second. We can start eating pies on Monday of Thanksgiving week, right? And that way we can sort of break up the pie. Well, it's turned into pie month now. <laughs> we just start making pie. And we make more than 27 different flavors of pie in our family um, between all of us bakers and things like that. So yeah, pie month is almost ready to begin. My wife's already started. All the dough has been made and frozen. Anyway, what is this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a number a lot of, a lot of people understand it to be 3.141597, blah, 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 right? Okay. But what is it? Like, what's its definition? Ratio of something. Ratio of something. Of what? A circle circumference to its diameter. How do you, what, are the, what are the units of a, of a, of a circumference? Meters. When you measure the circumference of a circle, what's it measured in? Meters. meters, a length, right? Meters, okay? What about the diameter? Also meters. Also meters. And a meter divided by a meter is a? No Nothing. And yet, this is called 3.14159, blah, blah, blah. Radians. So I ask you again, what's a radian? It's a label. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a unit, OK? It's a unitless unit, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's very weird. And it's not a degree, and it's a mode in your calculator that you're always going to get wrong depending on whatever class you're in, right? You've been there? You haven't been in the wrong? Yeah, OK. So how do you know when your calculator has to be in radians mode? Well, if the unitless thing you are measuring is measured in radians, it's in radians mode. If your angles are measured in degrees, which also are not a unit, it's just a label. It's a way of cutting up a circle into 360 different you know, same size chunks, right? They're not units the same way that, say, meters and seconds and kilometers and kilograms and all that. They're not units like that. They're handy labels that our human brains latch onto because it's just awkward to say, well, I went six. Six what? So, well, six radians, right? So, yeah, theta has to be in radians most of the time as we start doing this right here. Okay, so we've got that. Um, and then, uh, okay, so we can, this, this is a little bit fun. So our velocity, we could, instead of changing our like linear position, it works too if we change our arc length. 
So this would be d times r times theta, but again, what's changing in there? If something goes around in a circle, r or theta, which is what's changing? Theta. It's theta, right? So that r is a constant. And can we pull constants out of our derivatives? Yeah, get them out of there, right? So this becomes a v equals r omega. Right, we pull the r out, we have a d theta dt. And what's d theta dt? It's omega, isn't it? So we have a relationship between linear v measured in meters per second and angular omega measured in radians per second. And that relationship is talking about, well, if I've got an omega, then at every point along this circle, at some instant, I can say, take a look at this point right here. And it has a tangential velocity. That velocity right there is really the linear speed that something would have in that moment. Okay? I always like to think of like a bug or an ant or a ladybug or something sitting on the wheel as they're going around, right? That ladybug at a particular instant okay, would have a V off to this. And how do I know it has to be tangential? Well, this is centripetal motion after all, right? Okay? And so I know that there's acceleration pointing towards the center, but we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so this is really like a, a V sub T sometimes is written, okay? To just underscore that this is a tangential V that something would have even though it's moving in a circular path. It has that V at a, at a point or an instant. All right, uh, similar tricks can be pulled when it comes to alphas and A's. I'll just give you that one. And this again will be a tangential acceleration. If there's going to be an alpha, right, if I'm going to slow this wheel down and bring it to a stop, okay, we've already talked about how we have to have centripetal acceleration towards the center because this thing's moving in a circle. We know that there is a net force towards the center of the circle of anything in, of, of this tire and all points of it. But when we talk about alphas, that acceleration is happening tangentially. There's a center seeking acceleration for the change in direction, but as for the change in speeds that are taking place, that's a tangential acceleration. And so that's why we put those little T's on there. Um, so what does is, what is kind of all this look like? So if I had, say, an object down here, okay, and it, it, you know, my omega were counterclockwise, then it would have a tangential V. It would have a centripetal acceleration. And that centripetal acceleration, what, does anybody remember what our centripetal acceleration is? Which velocity? The, the, the tangential linear velocity. Okay. But since we know that that's equal to r omega, then we can write that as r omega squared. So there's lots of different ways to get around this thing. So we have centripetal acceleration velocity. We could have uh, centripetal or t sorry tangential accelerations in either direction, okay, which correspond to their given alphas. And now our acceleration doesn't have to just always be towards the center there can be a tangential component, which means the actual acceleration points off in some weird direction. I just got confused by the subtitle. Uh, AT and AC? Tangential. Mm -hmm. And A sub C, the C stands for? Centripetal, towards the center. So we have directions that act tangent to our circular path. And then we have directions that act inwards 
towards the center of our circular path. So what do we got? So we've got some, I mean, definitions. We've got some Google Translate um, terms right in there. Do you see how those, that second box down there in the middle of the screen allows us to get from a linear thing in meters per second to a rotational thing in radians per second and back and forth? Let's just, just so we have it on the page, how do you get between degrees and radians? This, for some reason, what's like the conversion factor? Pi radians is equivalent to how many degrees? 180. Okay, and so there's your there's your conversion factor. Okay, so if you, if you want your angle in radians, okay, you take your um, angle in degrees and you multiply. What goes on the bottom? 180 degrees, right? And then you put your pi radians on top. So your calculator knows how to get back and forth between them just fine. Uh, just make sure that your calculator is in the right mode. Where, so that mode, radians, degrees, G radians, which nobody uses anymore. Um, the mode of your calculator only matters when you are asking it about sine, cosine, and tangent. And I guess secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Because you're telling the calculator like what unit you're working in, right? So it, it, just watch out, right? If an angle is given to you in degrees, what mode do you want your calculator in when you hit sine, cosine, or tangent? Degrees mode. If an angle is given to you in radians and you want to find the sine, cosine, tangent of that, make sure you your, your thing's in radians mode. We are going to be guided by units in here. It's not a guessing game like it is in mathematics. Okay? <laughs> We're going to look at the units or the lack thereof to determine what's going on. Okay, so that is kind of a basic language and some definition and glossary terms and some visualizations about what we mean by when things are rotating. So now we get to tackle kinematics. Oh, I forgot to talk about, okay. There was one thing I swept under the rug that I forgot about. Anybody notice what it was? Direction, right? Because this is, these are vectors, right? Okay. So, <laughs> what direction is this wheel turning? Clockwise? Are you sure? Because it looks counterclockwise to me. Do you see the problem? Okay. It looks clockwise to you, but it looks counterclockwise to me. If I turn it around this way, it looks counterclockwise to you but to me it looks clockwise. So it seems like clockwise and counterclockwise, which we will use by the way, I'm not saying it's totally useless, is a little bit ambiguous, meaning that it depends on who's doing the looking, doesn't it? You could say the same thing about, I guess, about plus x and plus y or whatever that kind of stuff. But anyway, there is a more sure way to define the direction of this angular velocity, and it involves something called a right-hand rule. And I think this is the first time that you might have, you've encountered right-hand rules in this class. Some of you have probably encountered them in math class, especially for doing cross products and things like that, okay? This is not that right-hand rule, it's a different one, okay? <laughs> so the first step is to identify your right hand. Everybody put your right hand in the air. Repeat after me, I solemnly swear I'm up. No, 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 I'm no, not doing that one. Okay, yes, so I just had to make sure everybody knew which their right hands were. You can put your hands down there, right, okay? Some people, like myself, pretty confused, okay? Have I, have I, given, have I talked to you about the world's preeminent philosophers in this class? No? Oh, one of the world's preeminent philosophers, the greatest Thinker, one of the greatest thinkers, in my opinion, of our modern age, 
his name is Winnie the Pooh, said the following. I have no trouble telling my right paw from my left. It's knowing which one to start with that makes all the difference. That's deep. It's very deep. You just think, take the rest of the day to think about that one. Okay, right? <laughs> so identify your right hand, which is not this one. This is my left hand, okay, right? Identify your right hand. Everybody get your right hand out, okay? And what I want you to do is do a hitchhiker type sign with your thumbs out and your fingers are curled into your palm. You're going to curl your fingers around in the direction that the wheel is spinning, okay? Which way is this wheel spinning? It's wrapping around in the clockwise direction here. Which way does your thumb point? Kind of into the wheel, doesn't it? Okay, let's reverse it. Let's go the other way. How would you do the right hand rule now? You've got to turn your wrist, your fingers wrap around, and your thumb points which way? Out. Now, that's called the right hand rule for determining the direction of the angular velocity. Well, how does it? Well, how is this better than anything else, Mr. Bale? This is weird because you're basically telling me the velocity either points <laughs> that way, like in or out of the plane of this wheel, right? Well, watch this. You do, uh, you do the right hand rule for this one. Okay, spinning around. If I do the right hand rule, we agree in the about the same direction, right? Okay, we can do it this way. You do it. Okay, and now I do it, even from my point of view, and we both agree that it's pointing that way. Do it now. It's up, isn't it? Okay, what about now? It's going to the left, right? We can all agree, no matter which side of the wheel we are looking from, the right-hand rule will always put us in agreement with what direction that is. And yes, I know it's going around clockwise or counterclockwise, but the angular, the direction of the angular velocity vector will be pointed kind of along the axis of the wheel. Which also helps us to determine orientation of the wheel in space. So, but we'll get to that a little bit later. I just wanted to show that to you real quick because um, we have, we, it's going to come up again and I wanted that to be the preliminary. Let's get down some old friends. Back in the day when you thought physics was hard. Do you remember thinking the first unit was hard? And then the unit two happened, right? Okay. We had things like V equals V naught plus AT. We have, what was it, delta x equals v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. Delta x, delta y, doesn't matter. Uh, and then we had the third one with squares in it, so on and so on. Do you remember those? Yeah, nice little tools, OK? We've got to do the same thing in rotation. Yeah, and like I said, we're basically at a toga party, right? Nobody does toga parties anymore. You guys know what a toga party is? Party where you wear a toga, right? Okay. So, what do the rotational versions look like? Now, I could like derive all of these and prove it to you, but I'm not going to do that. You just have to trust me, which might be scary. But um, instead of V's, what are we going to write? Be careful. Omega is good. So omega equals omega naught plus, and instead of A, alpha. And then instead of T, there is no, it's just T. There's no Greek T. It's like the person that comes to the party and didn't get the memo. Right? Okay, good. All right. And then instead of delta X, Not the arc length, because that would still be kind of a linear distance. We need the rotational distance measurement. It's angle, it's theta. So delta theta, and instead of V, omega naught, and then a T plus one half, and instead of an A, alpha, and then a T squared. 
and then instead of a v squared, an omega squared, and then an omega naught squared, and a two alpha delta theta. There they are. Now, are the ones on the right any different from the ones on the left? No, I mean they're written with different symbols, but they're the same equations we had before. How did we approach using these tools before? First step. Visualize, strategize, do it, and check it. And our visualization was a list of knowns and unknowns. Maybe a picture, but a list of knowns and unknowns. And then our strategy was pick the tool that helps us get what we want, right? And then we do it, and then we check it. Sound familiar? That's what it is. Don't freak out just because they're written in Greek. It's the same relationships that have always been there. Now, for completeness in this toolbox, we should write down these two um, relationships, okay? Where these are the tangential Vs, the linear Vs, right? For things going in a circle. I always just like to have those on hand, okay? For what's going down. So. So this is the complete toolbox, and occasionally we will have to convert some linear things into rotational things, and vice versa, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. But so let's, let's do an example, okay? Uh, and we'll do an example where we work with hard drives. Oh, I sh let me go get a hard drive. We have some disassembled ones. Can you imagine the laptop this came out of? Yeah, this, this, is, this is back when, you know, computers were computers and men were men. And, no, whatever. This came out of a server from the 1970s, okay? I kid you not, this right here is a remanufactured washing machine motor, okay, that runs this thing. I believe this thing stored an incredible one megabyte of information. This is like one third to one fifth of a song. Imagine the size of the iPod that you would need, right? Why did I bring it out today? So hard drives, right, have these spinny bits in them. This is where the data is stored on these platters. And then there's a read-write head that goes across the front. Okay, we are going to focus on the platters themselves. Okay, these, it's, it's kind of a hard picture to see here, but there's platters inside this drive. The read write head goes across the top. And what we're going to try to do is figure out what the angular acceleration is for one of these drives when it's in its startup mode. So when you give a drive power initially, those of you that have hard drives still in your computers, you'll hear the computer, you'll push the button, there might be a few beeps, and then you hear kind of a <laughs> right, as the hard drive, like, the, the, it parks its heads, seeks its heads to calibrate it, and then it starts spinning up the disk. And once it spins up, it'll do like a chink, 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 and then it'll start reading. Now, I know all of these technical sounds because well, I was in college, community college. I worked at um, I worked at Seagate Technologies. At, in what was my title? I was in pre-sales technical support. So, before you ever bought a hard drive, I would provide technical support. Basically, we would have customers call us up. They could be either individual customers or more normally businesses would call us up and say, we're building like this server farm, we're doing this kind of thing. Here's the parameters that we need. What drives should we get? 
right? And so we would we would give them you know the type of drive and all. So we would try to get and then and then we were sort of like salespeople, but also technicians, um, try and help them out. Anyway, so. I had all this data on these hard drives, okay? And a typical hard drive that you will see in data storage nowadays, um, 7,200 RPM is pretty typical. Uh, 54 is the other one, but they're, they're kind of going away. So uh, I was able to look up and see that they spun up at 30 revolutions per second squared to get to the startup speed, okay? So we're gonna do this first part of the problem, right? And they're going they, what are they asking us for? How long does it take? They're asking for time, right? How long does it take? Time. What are the possible lists of things we could know and not know when it comes to rotation? Bless you. I mean, it's sitting right there in the box, isn't it? Where did we get our list from last time? We got it from our list of things in the box. So, so we could know omega. We could know omega naught. And what's the difference between omega and omega naught? Initial, final initial, right? OK. And then uh, we could know alpha, time, and delta theta. Have I run out of it? So we got omega, omega naught, alpha, time, delta theta. And then we start repeating, repeating all the way through. OK. so. I'm th this kind of like my list right now. Now I might have to reach for some linear ideas here in a second, okay? But we'll wait. We'll wait on that. This is the possible list of things I could know or not know if I'm going to solve the kinematics of this problem <coughs> in angular terms. Also, oh, I should have pointed out the stuff in the box over there. I don't see as any different as the stuff that's on the left-hand side of the screen. In fact, if you were quick, you might have noticed the mistake I made over here when I started writing my list. I said omega, but started writing v. That's because, in my mind, there's only three equations. And when I have to go do stuff in rotation, it's the same three equations written with the angular symbols. Okay. So it's not like we're learning three new equations. We're not. We're using the same three we had before. With the added twist of things going around in circles. OK. Do we know how fast these hard drive platters are going at the end? Yes. What's the speed? 7,200 erpums. What's an erpum or an RPM? It's a revolution per minute. Um, what should the units for angular velocity be? A radian per second. What should the units for alpha be? A radian per second squared. Okay. Is a revolution per minute anything close to a radian per second? I mean, close, but not very close. Yeah, so we're going to have to convert that number, aren't we? To get into the standard units of omega, we've got to convert that into radians per second. Okay, uh, what's the initial speed of the drive? Turning it on, it starts with zero, doesn't it? Uh, what do we know about its angular speed? 30 revolutions per second squared. Is that a standard unit? No, I'm going to fix that one. Uh, time. They don't give us time, but they are asking us for time, aren't they? And do we know how far in radians the, the disks turned? All this is, no, we have no idea. OK. So uh, what do you want to do first? You want to strategize, or you do want to fix the units? Fix the units. Fix the units. All right, 7,200 revolutions per minute. Now we're back to chapter one. <laughs> it's, just, it's all coming back, isn't it, right? OK. So uh, shall we fix the revolutions first? Yeah. OK. 
for every one revolution, a full circle of motion, how many radians are there? Two pi radians, right? Go around one revolution of a circle, that's two pi radians of radians. Okay, so now we're in radians, that's good, because um, we can calculate, we can remove the revolutions, all right, and then we need to get to seconds, so minutes. Where do I put minutes, top or bottom? It's on the top, and in one minute, there's how many seconds? 60 seconds, so there's how you convert from rupums to radians per second. Uh, I think I, did I do this? I did. I got 754 radians per second. No, I don't. I was hoping you'd back me up on it. All right. Uh, and then the other one we have to convert is the revolutions per second squared. Uh, do we need to do anything with the second squared? That's it's already, we're good there. So again, we just got to do one revolution for two pi radians. And that got me 188.5. Yeah, you can say that. Okay. All right. So I've got my units all sorted out. Standard units in equals standard units out. Strategy. I want T. All I've got is omega. Omega not an alpha. Which tool? I don't have theta. First one, it's got everything we want, it's got everything we have, and the one thing that we want. So my strategy is use the first equation, solve for t. So first equation, make it not, plus alpha t. I wrote, did I write it? I wrote it down correctly, look at that, all right. So, uh, let's see here, I can put number, I'm going to solve it for t first, omega minus omega naught, divide by alpha, there's my t. So, final omega, 754, minus my initial omega, all over my 30, no, my 188.5 radians per second, guarantees that I'm going to get this thing to come out in seconds, and I got, four seconds. Uh, why did I leave the alpha as positive? It was speeding up, right? Yeah. Going from zero to some speed. All right, so four second uh, time for that drive just to get up to speed uh, with that particular motor in it. Typically you would add about a second and a half to that number to, for the drive to sort out all of its error correction and calibration before it was ready to actually read write data. All right, um, data. Uh, today a lot of devices don't use hard drives, they use solid state drives. There's no moving parts in them, That's kind of, and they're much faster. Not only to start up and shut down, but also to like just read data in and out. However, all the stuff that's in the cloud is mostly stored on hard drives and some of it on tape. All right, uh, da, 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 second part. Oh, the data, oh, okay. One half cent, okay. So what we're trying to talk about here is that on this hard drive, okay, not all of this platter, this plate can be used to store information. There's a limit to how far the read write head can travel across the surface of this disk. And so this read write head doesn't push all the way up against this inner side. So there's like an inner radius to where the data starts, and then there's like an outer radius because the read write head can't like be floating over the edge of the disk. So there's portions of this disk that are unusable, and what they're asking us to find here is, right, how fast the platter is moving underneath the read write head when we're at the inner and outer parts of this motion. So it can be very difficult to see on this picture, and I apologize, but like, let's say that the data track starts at like this radius, something like that, and ends like out here at this radius, right? So the, so the data is all in here, okay? 
and we want to find out how fast the platter is going. Well, we know the answer in terms of angular speed, don't we? Like, how fast is it going at either of those locations? 754 radians per second, or 7,200 revolutions per minute, right? The angular speed will be the same regardless of the radius. So this problem isn't asking us for that answer. We already know that answer. It's asking us for the tangential speed, OK? Typically, when it says how fast, how long, how far, those tend to be the linear versions of these things, OK? You'll be asked for what is the angular speed at these points if they want you to be answering in terms of like omega, right? Or what's the angular acceleration? We typically, if there's no qualifier on it, it's a linear thing. But if we're putting those words about angles and things, then it's going to be the angular measure. So we need to find what the V tangential is for part B here. What is the V tangential? at the 1.5 centimeter radius, and then we got to do it again at the 4 centimeter radius. Well, how do we find V tangential if we know omega? Google Translate between linear and angular terms, right? It's a really easy Google Translate matrix. There's only two of them, right? So let's see here. The, the V for 1.5 centimeters is going to be equal to R omega. And that R has to be in meters. Yeah. So what's 1.5 centimeters in meters? 0 0.015. And then I put in my uh, 754. So that's radian per second. And this is a meter. Notice a meteor times a radian per second has what units? We don't say media, meters radian per second. What do we say? Meters per second. Because <laughs> a radian isn't a unit. It's a label. <laughs> okay. It does meaning, has no dimension to it. Um, what did I get for this one? Uh, 11.31 meters per second, OK? Or approximately 25 miles an hour. So that's how fast a piece of data is moving underneath the read-write head of the hard drive, the, 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 the thing that sends the information to the rest of the computer. OK, so for the 4 centimeter, we would put in 0 0.04 meters. At 754 radians per second, and we get 30.16 meters per second, or approximately 68 miles per hour. So there's a difference in speed for how fast the information is moving underneath that read write head, and the drive circuitry has to compensate for that. The performance of a hard drive depends on where the data is stored on the platters. Data that's stored further away from the center part of the disk can be accessed faster because it, the data is actually literally moving faster underneath the read-write head at that point. Data that's stored towards, more towards the middle of the drive is um, accessed slower. It's just read slower and copied and all that thing slower. Um, so it, back in the day, depending on how high performance they needed the solutions to be, we would have clever software algorithms that would only encode data that had to be read really fast towards the outer sides, right? Whereas data that was not sought after as much would be pushed more towards the inner sides. Anybody that's ever, and maybe this is dating myself, anybody's ever had to defragment a hard drive? Fragmentation arose because there would be data spread over many parts of a drive. And so the drive had to spend a lot of time seeking back and forth in and out. Whereas if it were properly stored, all the data would be stored together in one spot so that the drive had to seek very minimally and it could go faster. All of this is not a problem with the solid state drives of today. Um, the fastest drives that I know of that have been used in data centers uh, are around 15 to 17,000 RPM drives. The faster a drive goes, the sooner it's going to fail. 
in general. I'm talking about statistics now, which means I'm mostly lying. But in general, the faster they go, the faster they fail. Um, research at Seagate um, showed that there's a limit to how fast you can make a hard drive go before it starts blowing itself up. And um, that they, they, they had 55,000 RPM drives at one point. They never made it to market because they would just shatter themselves. And what they were discovering is that the outer edges of the platters, because the outer edge moves faster than the inner part does, they found that the outer edges of these platters were um, breaking the sound barrier before the inner edge was. And so the sonic booms would start this wiggling in the platter, and then the platter would just tear itself apart at those speeds. Um, so they then pulled a vacuum on the drive, and that worked for a while. And, and then they invented SSDs, and they didn't need to do fast drives anymore. So. But hard drives are still very, very prevalent in data centers for long-term storage. All right. So that's an example of kinematics. All right. Rolling motion. As a special example, just need to link something together for you and your brains to make rolling motion a lot easier. By rolling motion, okay, we mean a tire or a wheel that rolls along the ground without slipping. This is very important, okay? Because the kind of friction we want to have between a wheel and the ground is what kind? Static, Static friction. Because if it's kinetic friction, okay, there's now no link between the rotation, excuse me, the rotation of this wheel and what's going on on the ground. So when it says that something is rolling in a physics problem and they don't tell you anything else, you assume it's rolling without friction, uh, rolling without slipping, okay? Now, do we need friction in order for rolling motion to happen? Yes, yes. if this were a frictionless surface, this wheel would not roll, it would not rotate. The static friction is required. And we're going to get to energy and work other about this probably on Wednesday, okay? But you need to know right now that static friction needs to be here. We want to maintain static friction. If we do that, then for an object that's undergoing rolling motion without slipping, we've got some curious results. Let me get a, come back here. Let's get a, Tire on the ground, and then, so like here's the ground that it's traveling along. Um, let's say it's rolling like this, right? It's, it's turning like this. There's a central like axis, maybe like a car tire or something like that, okay? So, if I wanna talk about how fast this wheel is moving, there's different ways I can talk about that now, right? I can talk about linear speed. I can talk about rotational speed. But let's think about the cars, the wheels on your car. If your car is going 60 miles an hour, how fast are the wheels on your car going? There's, yeah, there's this, it could be like, there's like, oh, there's a lot of answers, but there's really only one answer. If your car is going 60 miles an hour, your wheels better be going 60 miles an hour, because if they're not, then the wheels are no longer attached to your car, right? If your wheels are going 70 and you're going 60, the wheels are not attached anymore, right? So what do I mean by that though? Like what part of the wheel is going 60 miles an hour? The very center of it, right? Okay. And so there is a speed, okay? We'll call it the center of mass speed. And I know I haven't done center mass yet. You know what center mass is, okay? The center of mass speed, the center of that tire speed 
has to be equal to the speed of your car. If not, the tires are not connected to your car. However, how fast is the top of your tire going? So like up here, now, do all points on this tire, top, bottom, sides, everywhere, do they all have to be going at 60 miles an hour sideways? What would happen if all different parts of your tires had all different speeds? Okay, it would fly apart, right? So, so do you agree that as your tire rolls along the road, the center, the top, the bottom, and the sides all have to have like a translational 60 miles an hour? They could be doing something else, right? Rolling that way, rolling that way. But there's a piece of them where they have to be moving sideways at 60 miles an hour? You agree? Yes? No? Otherwise, the tire falls apart, right? OK. So that means top, bottom, something, everything. But there is this added like rotational bit that we have to get into the mix, right? So the top of your tire is moving sideways with this center of mass speed, but it also has a tangential speed from the rotation, does it not? And that tangential speed is pointed in this case to the right, okay? So the tangential speed's pointed like this, okay? And the question becomes, what is that tangential speed? Like how fast is this top part up here rolling, right? If I roll this along, the center moves at some speed. How fast is this part going? Well, it's going faster than the center because there's rotation as well as translation. And it turns out the top here, this tangential speed, is twice the center of mass speed. Twice. Okay. So the tangential speed is equal to twice the center of mass speed. I'll show you why in a second. Okay. But let's now do the bottom. What direction, as this tire rolls forward, what direction does the tangential speed point down here? Backwards. Static friction is involved. So how fast is the surface of the tire moving compared to the surface of the ground? Zero. Zero. What's the speed of the wheel at the bottom? Zero. It's like there's a center of mass speed and a tangential speed, right? But the tangential speed is equal to zero. Well, the that's, that's a bad way to put it. The tangential speed is not equal to zero. Okay. I should have written this written this differently. Sorry. Back up. The tangential speed is equal to the center of mass speed. Down here, the tangential speed is equal to opposite the center of mass speed, because the direction flips. Okay? But when we add together to get the total speeds at the top and bottom, the total speed at the top is twice the center of mass speed. But the total speed at the bottom is zero. We know we have to have zero at the bottom of the tire because we need static friction. Static friction means the surfaces are not moving relative to each other. So we know the speed of the tire has to be the speed of the ground. Since the speed of the ground is zero, the speed of the tire has to be zero. But the whole tire is moving forward, which means that the wheel has to be rotating and have a rotational speed back, a tangential speed backwards equal to the forward speed for those to cancel out and become zero. And for that same reason, as we go to the top, those two add together. And since the tangential speed of the tire is related to the rotational speed of the tire, we end up with twice the center of mass speed at the top. The key relationship that is helping us through all of this 
is this one. This Google Translate back from when we did kinematics gives us the relationship between angular speed and tangential speed of a tire for anything undergoing rolling motion. This works for basketballs, it works for baseballs, it works for car tires, whatever okay, is rolling along the ground. If it's rolling and not slipping, that right there is the absolute truth. We're just about out of time, but just as a kind of a quick setup here, right? You have a car. Notice that they're giving us information in linear terms here, right? What's the 22 meters per second? Like, like from, from a list of things. Twenty-two meters meters per second. The unit's a dead giveaway. That's a velocity, and it's the final velocity, right? Because it ends there. What does it start with? Zero, right? The time is nine seconds. Okay. And then we're not really given any other information, right? We're given the diameter of a tire, but that's not a delta x, is it? Right? But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that we could have this kind of information, right? What are all these things over here? The rotational forms. But remember, we can get back and forth between rotation and angular terms if we use our Google Translate matrix. Oops. To our alpha. There we go. So, even though they gave us a, a velocity of 22 meters per second, we can convert that into an omega final. It's just you want to make sure that you use the center of mass speed, right? So to get like omega out of this, I take my V center mass speed, divide it by my R. Now, did they give us an R? They gave us a diameter. Careful, I make this mistake all the time, right? Diameter is not radius. <laughs> so if you give it a diameter, divide by two to get the radius, right? Okay, so we can get there, right? You can solve, I'm not going to solve this problem because we've done many of it like before. You can solve this problem entirely the chapter two way and then at the end convert into angular things. Or you can convert it into angular first and then just use the angular forms of the kinematic equations. It doesn't matter. It ends up being the same answer. It's just a question of conceptually in your brain, what do you feel more comfortable with, right? Do it both ways and then you've got your check right there. Uh, find the number of revolutions. So a revolution is defined as two pi radians, right? So they're asking you not to answer in radians this time. They're asking you to remember in a full revolution of the tire. Um, what is the final angular speed? So what are they talking about? Angular speed, what symbol would that be? Omega, right? We're looking for omega in revolutions per second. Notice that they're kind of doing weird units here. Very common in angular stuff, okay? So you'll probably work it all out and get it in radians per second and then have to convert. How many radians are there in a revolution? Two pi. So what did we cover today? All of chapters one through four, <laughs> right? Okay, with some circular bits thrown on top. On Wednesday, we're going to do chapters seven and eight and then loop back and do some five and six, right? So it's going to be energy and some forces on Wednesday. See you then.